Fifteen-year-old Mochizuki Toya finds himself in heaven. Standing before him is God himself, telling him that he is dead, and his death is a result of a mistake he had made. He tells Toya that he mistakenly sent lightning to earth, and he didn't imagine that there could be someone in that part of the earth where the magic had fallen. But Toya was there, and he died. He wonders if Toya can find a place in his heart to forgive him, and tries to beg Toya. But Toya doesn't seem worried. Toya admits that he didn't imagine that he would die at that tender age, but at the point that they are, the mistake has happened, and there's nothing he can do about it, even if he gets angry at God. In his mind, he acknowledges that his shallow play of maturity is just because his granddad has taught him that he should forgive. God is flattered by his maturity. He had expected that Toya would flare up at him and get angry, and he's glad that he didn't get much reaction from Toya. Meanwhile, Toya is concerned about what could be the next step of his life, and God tells him that every person has the right to be reincarnated once. That sounds good to Toya, who assumes that he'll be sent back to his world. But contrary to what he feels, God tells him that it doesn't work like that, and he can't return to his modern Japanese home. Instead, he can be reincarnated to another alternate world. Despite being in a not-so-favorable condition, Toya accepts it. His calm reaction to the complicated situation makes God feel more favorable to him and asks him what he wants from him. God tells Toya that he will do anything to make up for his mistake. And after Toya thinks deeply to find what he can ask for, he brings out his smartphone from his pocket and asks God if it's possible that his phone works in his new world. God agrees to do that. But when Toya asks if he can use his phone to contact his past world, God tells him that it's impossible. He tells Toya that he will give him another alternative and allow him to be able to use his phone to read everything going on in his world, but he won't be able to contact anyone. That condition goes well with Toya. God also tells him he will ensure his number is saved on Toya's phone, and Toya will be able to contact him. After their agreement, Toya wakes up in a tree in another world. He sees a road in front of him, and since he doesn't know the way, he decides that if he keeps walking that way, he will see a village. He receives a call from God, who tells him he has kept a map and navigation on his phone, which will make it easy for him to get his way around the city. With his map, Toya keeps walking straight. He thinks about how he doesn't have any food or water, and even if he finds a city, he isn't sure he can spend the notes that they spend in his world. As his luck will have it, a man rides on a carriage and rides beside him. The man is a merchant who is interested in trendy clothes, and he sees that the clothes Toya is wearing aren't ones that are popular around that side. Hence, he stops his carriage and goes to meet Toya, asking him to sell the clothes. Since Toya won't be able to walk naked, he drives Toya to his fashion store in the city, and inside the store, Toya changes his clothes and sells it to the merchant for money. Before leaving the store, he asks the merchant to tell him where he can get to an inn to sleep, and the merchant directs him towards the Silver Moon Inn. He walks to the inn, and on his way, he overhears a twin arguing with two men who had contacted them to buy their antler. Their agreement prior to the meeting was that the men would pay one gold coin, but after arriving, the men insist they will pay a silver coin because there's a mark on the antler. The girls refuse, and it causes an argument that draws Toya's attention. He goes there and tells the girl he wants to buy the antler for one gold coin, and they sell it to him. The merchants refuse to let him take it, and he just takes a stone, throws it at the antler, and breaks it. He angers the men who attempt to hit him, but he remembers the last word God told him. God told him that he will empower him with all magical skills, so much that he won't be able to die again unless it was a difficult circumstance. With his great strength, he defeats the men. He gives the girls their one gold coin, and they introduce themselves as Elza and Linza Silhueska. When he tells them his name, they assume he's from another village, and they assume he's from Ishin, but he doesn't bother to convince them otherwise. He tells them he's going to the Silver Moon Inn, and they tell him that they are lodged at the same inn. They take him to the inn, and after he books a room for a month, they sit to talk and eat. As they talk, the girls inform him that they had come to the city to sell their antlers, and Linza reminds Elza that she had told them they should register at the inn to get verified buyers instead of selling to merchants who just want to rip them off. They decide that they will register at the inn the following day, so they won't fall victim to bad buyers like they did that night. While Toya doesn't know what a guild means, he figures from their conversation that it's surely going to be a place where they make money. So he asks them if they can take him along to the inn the following day, and they accept. In his room, he reads news from his world. He sees that his favorite band has divided, and he comments that a lot has happened within his one-day absence. The following morning, he goes to the inn with the girls, and at the inn, they stand by the board to find a mission for them. 
Unfortunately, Toya realizes that although he can understand the language of the people in that society, he can't read their letters. He doesn't understand any of the things he's seeing, and he can't ask the girls because he would be embarrassed. Elza finds a good mission for her and her sister. It's a mission to kill five wolves for 16 copper silver, and it seems like an easy one for her. She asks Toya if he has found a good mission for himself, and he opens up to her that he can't read what's there. She reads her mission to him, telling him that she hopes they can be a party, as she needs to form a party with someone. He accepts to join their party, while he confides in Linza that he doesn't have any weapons to fight. They get him a weapon, and they also collect their guild tickets upon registration, and they leave to the forest to find the wolves. They fight with the wolves, and while Toya uses his sword, and Linza her powers, Elza uses magic, and Toya is shocked to see how magic is being used. After a successful mission, they kill six wolves instead of five, and their mission ends well. They take their proof to the guild, and the attendant signed their adventurer card, and pays them their reward. They return to the inn to eat, and as they eat, Elza appreciates Toya for joining them. She tells him he fought very great, and she was impressed, but he says he was nervous throughout the battle. She asked if he will permanently join their party, and while he accepts, he says he will need some favor from them too. Since he has done them favors before, granting him one or two favors isn't too much for them, and they ask him to request what he wants. He begs them to teach him how to read and write, because he won't survive in that city unless he can read and write their language. Elza asks Linza to teach him, and he also says he would like them to teach him how to use magic. Linza explains to him that magic isn't what anyone can learn, and there are specific people who can learn it. She tells him that magic is inborn, and it's always in a child's aptitude, so if he doesn't have it in his aptitude, he won't be able to learn it. He tells her he is sure he will learn it quite well, because a person has given him the powers. He asks if there's a way he can check his aptitude, and Linza brings out some special stones. She explains to him that all the rocks represent several elements, and he can find out if he can use magic immediately. She tells him that the easiest magic is water magic, and she takes the stone for water magic. She puts the rock in her hand, and she calls out water. Then, water comes out of the stone. She passes the stone to Elza, asking her to do it, but Elza can't call water forth. They explain to Toya that the powers are different from one another, and while Linza uses water magic, Elza, who is her twin, can't use it, but Elza can use fortification magic, while Linza can't. They give him the stone, asking him to call forth water. And when he does, his water flows so much that it pours onto the table. They want to try out other elements, but they can't do that in the inn. So they go out, and he takes the other stones. He uses them one after the other, and they realize that he can use all the magic. He can use earth magic, light magic, darkness magic, fire magic, water magic, and even wind magic. Elza is shocked, and she asks him where he's coming from. Linza tells him that it's rare for a person to use the six elements, and even she uses only three. It's still a rare privilege. He sees another stone on the table, and they tell him it is null magic. They explain to him that it doesn't have a specific magic, and it is personal. While some can get fortification to boast their power like Elza, some get gate, the ability to go anywhere. He asks to try that magic, and they allow him. He seems interested in gate magic, and Linza asks him to try it, and when he does, it turns out the magic worked. It opens the gate to the forest they were coming from. Linza also tells him that gate can only take a person to where he knows. Elza keeps accusing him of having superpowers, and wants to know where he learned from, and they enter the inn. As they talk in the inn, the receptionist Micah comes to meet them. She tells Elza that their chef, Ayer, wants to learn how to make new meals, and she needs a recommendation. The girls have no idea, so they ask Toya to recommend food from his side. He asks what kind of food, and they explain that they need desserts that ladies will like, and he suggests ice cream. They don't know what ice cream is, so he brings out his smartphone. When they see the phone, they ask him what it is. He tells them it's a personal magical tablet that only works for him, so they shouldn't interfere. He browses for the recipe and the procedure for making ice cream, and asks Linza to make ice for him. He uses the ice to create his ice cream, and when the girls taste it, they are so satisfied. Micah and Air insist they will learn it, and Elza asks him where he is from again. He refuses to give an answer, but tells them that the ice cream is their reward for helping him to learn magic. They take another mission, which turns out to be a mission to deliver a letter to the royal capital. The mission requires that they will travel from their city to the royal capital, which will take several hours, and Toya thinks that the mission is unnecessarily stressful. They stop by a city to rest, and he asks the girls why they didn't allow him to take the second mission, which is to kill mega slimes instead of the mission to travel. They both refuse to hunt slimes. 
They claim the creatures are annoying and irritating, and they can't deal. He accepts that they'll be going to the royal capital, and they stop to eat and find an inn. The girls miss the Silver Moon Inn, and they hope that there will be a better inn in that city, so he advises that they should use Gate to spend the night at Silver Moon and return to that place the next day. But they refuse, claiming when you're at a new place, you have to enjoy the new city and everything that they have, so they should find a good place to eat and an inn in that place. As they attempt to do so, they see a lady fighting against some men. She is so skilled, and Toya recognizes her skill as jujitsu. However, she is hungry, so she gets tired easily. The men are about to capture her, so Toya calls his earth magic and blocks their faces, while Elsa fights some of them off. The guards are coming, so they all run away. They stop running at a hideout, and the girl introduces herself to them as Kokonoi Yai from Ishin. He looks at her fighting skill and how familiar it is, and he tells her he comes from a city familiar to hers. Her stomach makes hunger signs, and she tells them she has lost her travel money, so they ask her to join them as they eat. She eats a lot, and explains to them that she's from a family of swordsmen, and she's taking that travel to increase her skills, and she's going to the capital. Elsa asks if she will follow their carriage, since they are also going to the capital. Linza accepts to accommodate Yai, so Toya reluctantly accepts too, but fears their feeding allowance will finish fast. They start the journey, and in the carriage, Linza ensures Toya reads a book about null magic so he can know all about the magic available and learn to use them. He claims most of the magic isn't useful. He finds one called Aports, which can be used to drag nearer something from a distant place. He practices it to take Yai's scarf, and it works. Elza tells him the skill can be counterproductive, as it can also be used to steal, but they ask him not to do such. He also sees the long sense skill, which can be used to see something from afar off and also smell something. After using it, he senses blood nearer to them and assumes that people are in trouble. He asks Yai to drive faster and they see a carriage being attacked by goblins. They join the fight and they defeat the goblins. They realize that there is someone summoning the goblins and he uses his null skill to defeat the man and they capture him. The guards appreciate them for their help and they hear a noise from inside the carriage. A young girl screams that her guard is dying and an arrow has broken in his chest. Toya asks Linza to use healing, but she says that there's no way she can heal him because the arrow is inside of him. Toya decides to use the A-ports to bring out the arrow, and they use healing skills to heal him. The guards are happy. Their head introduces himself as Liam, the Duke's butler, and the young lady beside him is Duke Ortelinda's niece, named Sushi Arena. Liam tells him they don't think they can escort Sue to the city successfully, so he should guard them, and since they're going in the same direction, he accepts. At the royal city, they meet Sue's father, Alfred Ernest, who appreciates him for his kind gesture. He asks to have a meal with him, and when they talk, Toya asks if Alfred knows who could have targeted Sue. Alfred says he doesn't know, and Sue also joins the conversation. Alfred asks her if she's spoken with Ellen, and she replies affirmatively, but says she didn't tell Ellen about the attack because Ellen would get concerned. Toya gets curious, and he asks who Ellen is. Alfred tells him Ellen is his wife and Sue's mother, but she is blind. He explains that Sue's journey to her grandmother's place is to find anyone who could use her grandfather's powers to heal her mother, but she can't find it. He explains to Sue that null skills are personal skills, and that there is no one who can use her grandfather's skill. When the girls hear this, they join the conversation and ask Toya to read about the skill. He reads about recovery, and they go to Ellen's room. He uses recovery to heal Ellen, and she sees again. They are all happy and overjoyed. Alfred meets them later that day, and he appreciates them for what they have done for his family. As a reward, he gives Toya 40 platinum gold, which is worth billions in yen. Toya refuses it, telling him it's too much. But Alfred says if they want to become good adventurers, they will need that capital, so they should take it as an investment. He brings out a box containing medals from his family, and he shares it among the team. He explains that the medal will allow them to take privileges that belong to the Duke's family as a reward. They all bid Sue goodbye, and they go to deliver the letter. After delivering, they ask Yai what her next course of action is, and she asks if she can follow them and work with them. They welcome her to their party. They decide that since they're already in the royal city, they can as well shop before they leave, so they try to find places where they can buy things. On their way, Toya sees some demi-humans, and since he hasn't met any in their city before, he asks the girls what they are, and they tell him that they are demi-humans who live just like humans, and they include elves, dwarves, and so on. As they walk around, he sees a young girl who looks disturbed. 
She's been looking around, and she looks lost, so he goes to meet her. He asks her what is wrong with her and if there's any way he can help her. At first, she is scared of him, but when he reassures her that he means no harm, she explains to him that she was meant to meet some of her people at a specific place, but it turns out that she is lost. He brings out his phone, and he uses the map to guide her until they get to her sister. The young lady appreciates them for taking care of her sister, and they return to their initial plan of shopping. He tells his colleagues that they may get misplaced if they shop together too, so they should shop separately and meet at the inn in two hours. Two hours later, the girls are at the carriage waiting for him, but he is late. When he arrives, he checks his time to see that he is 25 minutes late. They are shocked that the phone also shows time. They enter the carriage and return to their city. He remains at the inn, and one morning he walks out to see Micah weeping. She complains about two adults who are playing shogi games and disturbing her. He sees that their board isn't broad enough, and he decides to make a better board for them. He uses another null skill named modeling to model a new board, and the men really enjoy playing on their new board. He asks Micah where his girls are, and she tells him that Linza is in her room, while Yai and Elza have gone to the parent to taste the new dessert he had recommended to the chef. Yai and Elza arrive with the meal. They give one to Micah, and they have two extra ones for themselves, and they ask Toya to take a portion to the royal capital and give it to Alfred and Sue. He also makes a shogi game for Alfred, and Sue really enjoys the meal. Alfred wishes they had someone who could make such a meal for them in their city, but he doesn't have gate power, so he can't jump to buy it. So Toya suggests he can give their maid the recipe. However, Sue's mother says too much of something is too much, so they shouldn't bother. He introduces the shogi game to Alfred. Alfred plays with him and sees that the game is played by eliminating your opponent's team and building your team. They play until night, and later that night, Toya leaves the royal city. He brings his party to the royal city guild so they can get a mission there. He offers them another mission to kill Mega Slimes, but the ladies refuse, so they go on a mission to the old royal city where they kill a monster there. When they arrive, the beast seems difficult to be killed, but since they are all skilled in their ability, they find it easy to kill the monster. After killing it, Elza wonders if there's any treasure in that city since it's a former royal city, so Toya decides to use a search to find any treasure. Linza suggests that that may be because there's a treasure that he doesn't count as a treasure, so he decides to search for any ancestral relics, and his skill finds one. They follow the direction in which they have found it until they get to an underground basement. Linza uses her light skills to light the way as they try to find the treasure, and then they see a wall with some weird handwriting. None of them can read the words on the wall, so Toya takes a picture of it for future purposes. He uses his earth skills to break down the wall, and after breaking it down, they see a weird object with red light inside of it sealed underground. They wake the stuffed monster and notice Linz's light is getting dim. They realize the beast is sucking their powers. The monster awakens and attacks them. They use gate to return outside the house, but the monster follows them. They have no other choice but to fight but they realize that the monster regenerates after their attacks. The monster uses its powers to regenerate and grow his body, and it is difficult to kill it. The monster injures Elza, but Toya heals her. Toya thinks of what they can do to defeat the horrible monster, and he figures the red light is his power, so he makes a plan with Elza, hoping it will work. He uses A-ports to remove the red light from the body and throws it to Elza, who breaks it with her boast energy. The body melts immediately. They win the fight, but assume they have taunted a powerful object. So they go to report to Alfred. Toya shows him the picture of the wall he took with his phone and tells him he will make the picture available for him, while Alfred thinks they will be the ones to help them uncover the mystery behind why the royal capital was relocated from the old place, since there is no history about it. The party members eventually return to their inn, and Toya makes the picture available. He teleports back to Alfred's house to give the report, but sees that Alfred is going out. Alfred stops his carriage immediately, telling Toya that he is glad Toya is around, and he's going to the Duke's house, as the Duke has been poisoned, so Toya should follow him. On the carriage, he asks Alfred what had happened to the Duke, but Alfred says he thinks the Duke may have been poisoned by some of his political opponents, as they are against his political involvement with a neighboring town of beastmen called Mismead. The king of Mismead is a beast, and the Duke wants to create a relationship with the two kingdoms, so he thinks that's the reason the Duke was poisoned. He says that the Duke has a young daughter, Yumina, and she will become the Duke if the King dies. He feels the person who had poisoned the King intends to use political marriage with Yumina to get control of the kingdom, so he wants Toya to heal his brother with recovery. They eventually arrive at the palace, and by the stairs, 
they meet one of the Duke's ministers, Count Balsa, who tells Alfred that they have found the person who poisoned the king, and the person is a messenger from the beast land, and they will cut off her head and send it to her king. However, Alfred insists that they do not do that, and they should wait for the king to recover. As Balsa walks down the stairs, Toya uses slip to make him fall off. They get to the Duke's room, where the Duke is lying sick on the bed, and beside him are his wife and daughter, his general, Leon, and Charlotte, the Duke's family priest. They all wonder who Toya is, but Alfred says he will explain later. Immediately, Yumina sees Toya. Her face turns red. Toya goes to use recovery to heal the king, and when the king recovers, Charlotte is shocked that there is someone with the ability to use recovery, because it's a long-gone null spell. The king appreciates Toya for his help, and Alfred explains that Toya healed his wife too. Yumina falls in love with Toya, and asks him if he likes ladies that are younger than him. Alfred gives the report that Balsa thinks the beast poisoned him, so they call the messenger from Miss Mead to meet with the king. The messenger turns out to be Olga Strand, the sister of the young girl who Toya found with his party. Toya asks to see the room where the king collapsed, and when he gets there, he uses a search to find the poison. Toya asks Leon to call the duke's party and asks them to bring Balsa. He tells them the person who has poisoned the king is in that room. He brings the wine Olga brought and pours it into a cup. He then asks Leon to drink it, and when Leon does, Leon sees the wine isn't poisoned, so he pours the wine into the duke's cup and asks Balsa to drink it. Balsa refuses to drink, so they force it on him. Immediately, he swallows it. He starts screaming that he's been poisoned. Toya tells him that he has cleaned the cup, and he reveals to the party that Balsa poisoned the duke's cup. Balsa attempts to run away, but Toya uses slip to make him fall down. After the reveal, the duke appreciates Toya for helping him. As they talk, Yumina tells him that she has a request, and she says she wants to get married to Toya. Her father asks her why, and she explains that it's because Toya is pure and helps people. So her father agrees to the union. However, Toya refuses. He says that Yumina doesn't know him well, but her parents explain that Yumina has mystic eyes of intuition, which allows her to see into people's characters, so they have no course of worry. He still refuses, claiming that she's a child. They tell him Yumina is 12, and most royal marriages occur at the age of 14. They also got married at 14, so Yumina is mature. He argues that in his city, men can only marry at the age of 18, and he is still 16, so the Duke tells him he should use the remaining two years he's got left to get to know Yumina, and she should also warm up to him. After two years, they will discuss their marriage. He regrets his sudden engagement and receives a call from God, who congratulates him. He returns to his city with Yumina and introduces her to his friends. She tells them she also wants to register at the guild and join them at the party. They wonder why Toya agreed to marry her, but he tells them it was so fast and he didn't have a say. Elza reminds them that since Yumina is the princess, then Toya will be their next duke. He refuses the responsibility. However, Yumina says it's their child that will take the throne. The following day, they register at the guild, and they take on a mission to kill a king ape. Yumina has specifically requested that mission, so she will show them her skills. And when they get to the forest, she tells them she also knows magic, and she knows how to shoot arrows, so they don't have to worry, and she will be a plus in their team. She uses her summoning skills, and she summons a pack of wolves. She tells them that the wolves can help them search for the apes. That's the first time Toya is witnessing a summoning skill, so he tells her that after they finish, she will teach him how to use it. The wolves enter the forest, and they draw the apes out. When the apes come out, the party attacks them with their skill, and in a few minutes, they defeat them all. Yumina asks her colleagues how she did, and they all give good remarks about her except Toya, who claims he is now the only male among four girls. And even when there were three girls, people look at him at the guild with jealous eyes because the girls are cute. They all get emotional, and Yumina asks for her compliment too, so he tells her that she is also cute. As they return to the inn, she teaches him how to summon, and he summons an object, only for them to find out he has summoned the White Tiger, the greatest beast which can be summoned, and they are called the White Monarch. Yumina tells him he has to form a pact with the tiger, and the tiger refuses the pact unless he proves he is strong enough. The White Tiger asks him to put his hand on his head, and when he feels Toya's magic power, he begs for the pact. Toya doesn't know how to form a pact, but the tiger asks for a name, so he names him Kohaku. Kohaku asks to stay beside him forever, but he thinks the tiger is too big for that. So Kohaku changes into a small, cute tiger. The girls pick him up and play with him. They get another mission, and this time around, the mission is directly from the Duke. The girls are moody, and that doesn't seem like the type of mission they want to get involved in, and he asks them why. 
He tries to cheer them up, telling them that it's their first mission with Kohaku, so they will really enjoy the mission, but they remind him that the mission is to investigate a slime researcher who has most likely created several slimes. They are all concerned that the green slimes melt the female's body, and they can't bear to get nearer to it. Toya imagines them with melted clothes, and when Yumina sees his thoughts, she asks him if he isn't thinking weirdly. Kohaku tells them that they don't have to worry, and they won't fight as much as he can do the entire work. They wonder if it's really necessary for them to take the mission, especially since the slimes aren't disturbing any city, so why should they kill them? Toya thinks otherwise. He asks them what their duty is as adventurers if they will wait for the slimes to attack a city before they defeat it. Reluctantly, they get to the researcher's castle. As they get to the door, Toya tells the girls that the castle is a safe place, but the word backfires on him as a basin falls on his head. He tries to recover, and they see that the basin changes and eventually becomes a slime, a white slime for that matter, and they have never seen a white slime before. They go to the first floor of the house, which is the researcher's library. They try to find any book that can expose them to what the researcher is doing, but most of the books have been eaten by slimes. Linza eventually finds one, and the book has all the experiments the researcher has made. They proceed to the second floor, and they encounter several green slimes. The slimes come toward them, and the girls are scared. Linza attempts to use her fire magic, but Toya stops her because he knows her magic can burn the house. So he asks Kahaku to defeat the slimes. When they realize the slimes are many, they proceed to the next floor, but Elza falls. They see some white slimes emitting lotions, and Linza reads that they are lotion slimes that emit watery lotion when they sense danger. The lotion makes them slip down, but Kohaku saves Toya. The girls fall into the second floor, and the green slimes invest in them, thereby melting their clothes. Toya uses Gate to bring them back to the third floor, and they change their clothes. They continue to a passage in the building, where they see some statues. The statues look naked, and they have big chests. While looking at them, Toya notices that their chests are moving, he goes nearer to press it, and a watery slime which is about pink in color falls off. The slime is called the bust slime. They pretend to be like ladies' busts, and they are attracted to ladies with small busts. They try to jump on Yumina, who attacks them. She feels insecure about her figure and tells them she is still growing. They eventually get to the researcher's office. They see his dead body and a pre-death note where he says he has attained what all men want to attain, and he can die now. They look forward, and they see that he has created naked slimes who look just like humans. The girls cover Toya's face so he won't look at it. They burn the building, and Kohaku asks him to take him to the city. The following day, he goes to show Kohaku the city. In the city, he sees Yai with a crying girl. Yai says the girl has misplaced her mother, and the girl is crying but refuses to say her name. He gives Kohaku to the little girl, and the girl says her name is Lim. He tries to use his search to find Lim's mother, but it doesn't work, so he uses an enchanted version of the search on his smartphone, and he finds the woman. He returns Lim to her mother and goes to eat with Yai, who tries to ask how he used the phone. He tells her he had used enhanced search with his phone, which allows him to search for people in the longer range. Yai says she wants to know where her brother is, and he helps her search for her brother. After finding him, she tells him he is so much like her brother. He is kind and compassionate. She assumes he might take the compliment as a proposal, and she quickly screams that she isn't saying she likes him. At home, he tries to use a more enchanted version on his smartphone, and he uses his long-range seeing to check Linz's room. He watches her naked and feels bad about what he has done. She knocks on his door to tell him she went to the antique to learn more skills because she found out she can't use her fire skill in closed spaces, so she bought a book that she can't read. He helps her create a glass to read it, and she learns the skill of bubble bomb in the book. She tries to practice it, but fails and eventually runs out of mana. He takes her home, and the following day, she comes to try again. She runs out of mana, and he refills her with his mana. He tells her he learned the skill from Charlotte. She complains that she has to picture the skill first, and he tells her it's just like soap bubbles. When she pictures soap bubbles, she gets it. They go to fight a monster who breaks Elsa's gauntlet. She doesn't want to repair it again, so Toya advises that she get another one, and he follows her to the royal capital to get it. At the capital, Elsa sees a gown she likes, and although she claims it won't look good on her, he forces her to try it on and even buys it for her. When she wears it at home, the other girls like it, and they ask him to buy it for them too. At that point, Yumina receives a letter calling her to come to the palace with Toya, so they can grant him his knighthood for solving the researcher's case. He asks if it's possible he reject it but she tells him he has to tell the public the reason for his rejection, which leaves him with no choice but to accept it. 
they all relocate to another house. They stand in front of the mansion, which has been donated to him by the Duke, and he wonders why they had given him that great mansion. After visiting the Duke for his reward, he assumes that they will give him a knighthood, and he has been thinking of the best way to reject it, but they offer him another thing that he can't reject, thereby putting him in a corner. They give him that house, and when they enter, he says that the house is too big, and it will be difficult for the five of them to clean up. The other girls are shocked. They had assumed that the Duke gave him the house, so he will live there with his wife, and they think they will be intruders if they stay with him. They ask him if he really wants them to stay, and he tells them that they are his family, and he considers them the same way he does with Yumina. They get flustered, and they give several excuses to leave. Yumina, on the other hand, is glad that he at least considers her as family, and she tells him she doesn't have an intention to monopolize him, so he goes to meet the other girls. He goes outside to the field with Kohaku, and he overhears the girls having a conversation. Later, they all come to meet him, asking him if he is sure he wants them to keep living with him, and if he won't send them away. He promises them that they will live with him without knowing the weight of his words. Later, the Duke's brother, Liam, comes with some maids and security. He tells Toya that he will now work as Toya's butler, and it's his way of saying thank you to Toya for saving his brother, Liam. They receive a visit from Alfred and Sue. Sue congratulates her cousin on her engagement, but Alfred says he had intended that Toya would marry Sue. But it's all good. He tells Toya that his major reason for visiting is because their country has decided to have a relationship with Miss Mead and it will require the two kings to meet for a conversation. However, traveling can be risky, so they want to use Toya's gate. He reminds Alfred that he can only use gate for a place he has visited, and Alfred says that they want him to visit Miss Mead. Toya's party meets with Olga and her sister, then some guards from the Duke's palace headed by Leon, and they start the journey. They all play games in the carriage until the evening, when they stop at a place to sleep as they rest. Olga feels like there are some bandits around them, she informs the crew, and Toya uses his phone to find their location, then pin them and paralyze them. After paralyzing them, he goes to find them. His party members notice that Leon is attracted to Olga, but can't tell her. They wonder if Olga knows about this attraction. The following day, they enter a city. In the city, Toya walks with Yumina and Olga's sister Alma, and they see Leon wanting to buy a hairband. They walk closer to him to ask what he needs it for, but he says he wants to buy it for his mother. Toya notices he is indecisive, so he asks Alma what kind of band she wants. He allows Alma to pick one and pays for it, then asks Alma which type Olga will want. When Alma points to one, he leaves Leon to buy it. They go by sea to their next kingdom, and Linza gets seasick. He carries her to the land, and when they are about to enter the carriage, he drops her. Yumina sees the hair clip Alma picked on Olga, and she figures that Leon has given it to her. She comments that she wishes the man she cares about would do something like that too. They stop to rest for the night, and while everyone rests, Toya uses Gate to take his friends home so they can clean up. When he returns, he finds the people disturbed, and they see a dragon flying to a nearby city. Toya figures the dragon is going to Eld Village, so he leaves with his party to protect the villagers. When they get there, the dragon has burnt the kingdom down. Toya sacrifices himself and lures the dragon to the forest so they can fight. He uses his spell to attack the dragon, while Linza cuts off its wing. The dragon gets furious and fights back. The team spends time fighting back before they eventually win. After the dragon dies, another red dragon comes. He apologizes for what his subordinate has done, saying he went berserk. He sees Kahaku and realizes it's the white monarch. He assumes it's Kohaku who defeated the dragon, but Kohaku says it's his master. He can't believe that a white monarch can allow a human to lead him, and he bows to Toya, apologizing to him. They return to their camp, and he tries to sleep. Yumina gives him a blanket, but when he wakes up, he wakes up on her leg. He sees the other girls are angry at him, and he wonders what has happened. But Yumina tells the girl that it was a rock-paper-scissors game, and she won, meaning she won the opportunity to allow him to rest on her body. He still doesn't understand, and he asks Kohaku, who tells him it's just women fighting. Leon wonders which type of people they are, that they could single-handedly defeat a dragon, and then use their magic to heal all the villagers that have been injured. They didn't stop at that point. They also donate all the good parts of the dragon, which could be sold for a great amount of money so the villagers can use it to repair their village. He wonders what kind of wonderful people they are, and he says he doesn't know where they're from. The chief of the Eld Kingdom comes to appreciate Toya. He brings a fang from the dragon, saying he heard Toya's sword got destroyed during the fight, and Toya can use the fang to make another sword for himself. He also gives Toya a knife, telling him he found the knife on the dragon's body. Toya realizes the knife came from people they didn't know, and in the carriage, he asks Kawaku if there were anyone watching them during the fight. 
Kohaku tells him he sent some people but assumed they were villagers, so Toya promises to find them. They get to the Mismead Kingdom, and they meet the king, Jamaka. He appreciates them for taking care of Olga, and says that he heard they saved the Eld village. Yumina stands up to introduce herself as the princess. She tells Jamaka that her father has sent her to deliver a letter to the Mismead village, and they have realized that the union between them is very important. Jamaka collects the letter, hoping to read it later, and tells Toya that he loves to hear that a person is strong, so he would like to fight with Toya. They get to the field, and the moderator says the fight will only stop when a person has been fatally injured or he accepts defeat. They also tell him that magic can be used, so as the fight starts, he uses Slip to make Jamaka fall down and says he is one, but Jamaka refuses, saying he didn't know that the Null Power exists and that power doesn't give him an opportunity to fight at all, so they should start again. This time, spells can be used, but he can't use Slip. His friends wonder if he can win, especially because Jamaka has more physical strength than him. He sees Jamaka use a Null skill called Excel to disappear and fight him, so he asks for Jamaka's permission to use it too. They fight in their shadow form, and on the first attempt, none of them wins. They go for the second attempt, and Toya wins. Jamaka accepts the defeat. The following day, they have a welcome party. Leon comes to ask for Olga, and they see her looking radiant. Yai, Linza, Elza, and Yumina also dress in Miss Mead native attire, and they look gracious, so he decides to take their picture. When Jamaka sees the smartphone, he wonders what it's for, and Toya tells him it's a personal null skill that allows him to take a picture, and he can also print it. Jamaka requests a picture, so he draws out Jamaka and the other guest who would like pictures. He gets exhausted from doing all that, and after the party, he sits to rest. He sees a teddy walking toward him, and the teddy calls him. The teddy takes him to a room to meet his master, Lean. Lean introduces herself as the elder of the fairy tale, although Toya is told that she's much older than him and maybe 600 years older. She says she has heard that he killed a dragon. He looks at the teddy, which she names Paula, and asks if Paula is her familiar. She tells him that Paula is just a teddy, and she has used one of her null skills called Program to program Paula to walk and talk, so it's not like it's human. She experiments with the skill in front of him and commands a chair to walk. He asks if he could use it too, and to her shock, he gets it on his first attempt. She realizes that he is as strong as she has assumed, and she asks him to be her apprentice, but he refuses. Later, he decides to use the program skill to make a weapon for himself. As he attempts to leave the kingdom to try it, he sees Yumina and Linza, and they go together. He uses modeling to turn the fang into a gun, and creates bullets. He uses program to command the bullet to shoot, and he achieves his aim. The girls ask for guns too so he makes them for them. He then uses program to turn the weapon into a double weapon, which is a gun and a sword, and names it Brunhild. He tells the girls that after fighting with the king, he realized he would need a weapon to use in case of a fight where magic isn't allowed. That's why he made the weapon. They train until night, and on their way home, Yumina says she's hungry and recommends that they eat curry. Kohaku notices that someone is following them, and Toya uses Excel to find the stalker. The stalkers run away, but he catches up with them, and he shoots fake bullets at them to weaken them. He ties them up to find out who they are, and he sees it's his chefs, Lapis and Cecile. They tell him they're working under the king's command to protect Yumina, but Yumina must not know. He also finds out the knife they found on the dragon belongs to Cecile. They ask him not to inform Yumina about their presence, and he accepts. He joins the girls at the restaurant, and they eat. Eventually, the duke arrives at Miss Mead to meet the beastmen. While they have their meeting, Toya waits outside for them, and Lean feels she really wants Toya to be her apprentice. She remembers her last apprentice works at the king's palace, and it's Charlotte. She claims she has to visit the Belfast kingdom to meet Charlotte. They eventually return home, and they meet Lapis and Cecile at home. Lapis and Cecile go to appreciate Toya for bringing them home with the gate, before he brings the others. He tells them he had no choice because he can't bring them with the others if he doesn't want Yumina to know she was being followed. Yumina gives a gift to Lame, and he comments that he will value it with his life, but Toya thinks it's just overexpression. The following day, he buys some materials from the market, and uses modeling to mold them. As he does so, he receives a visit from Alfred, who comes to appreciate him for their mismead trip. He sees him modeling something, and asks what it is, so Toya tells him it's a bicycle. He asks Toya to mold one for him, and he tries to ride it. He falls on his first attempt, but he eventually gets a hold of it, and keeps training. The girls arrive, and they also like the bicycle, so they ask to ride. Linza is unable to ride well, and she says it's difficult, but Yumina rides it perfectly. When he sees Yumina riding, 
She gets jealous and says that she will also try to ride. She rides it perfectly and she gains Toya's compliment. This makes Elsa jealous. Elsa drags Ye from one of the bicycles and she rides too. Alfred is impressed, so he asks Toya to visit the market and buy more materials to make a bicycle for Sue. As he does so, he sees some pickpockets trying to bully a little child who also picks pockets. He tells them that since they are all thieves, he will shoot them, so he shoots them with rubber bullets. When he attempts to leave, the child appreciates him, and he tells her to stop stealing. He hears the sound in her stomach that signifies that she is hungry, so he decides to take her to eat. After eating, he asks her about her parents, but she tells him her father went to defeat a beast about a year ago and didn't return, and her mother died when she was a kid so she doesn't have any other means to make money than to pick a pocket. She introduces herself as Renee, and he asks if she will work at his house, which Renee accepts. He takes Renee home, and Liam dresses Renee. He tells Renee she will be their servant. It turns out that Toya forgot his mission to the market and didn't buy the materials. Later, he travels to Miss Mead on Sue's demand. Sue is the only one who hasn't gotten to Miss Mead, and she wants to go, so she begs him to take her, and he does. She enjoys the view of the city, and while they look around, they see Arma. They call out for her, and they play. They notice Leon and Olga going out too, and Arma says that day is important for her sister, so she must tail them. Sue follows her, leaving Toya and Yumina with no other choice than to follow too. They see how shy Leon is, and how he can't hold Olga's hand. They watch as the lovers enter into a restaurant to talk, but they can't enter the restaurant with them, so they won't be noticed. The girls want to keep watching, so Toya uses long sense to watch the lovers. When the lovers leave the restaurant, Arma tries to run to her sister, but she mistakenly hits someone on the way. They realize the person is the Beast King. They call out to the Beast King, asking why he's out in public in disguise and without his guards, but he says that he enjoys going out a lot. They watch Leon and Olga together, and the Beast King is angry that men in these days are no longer bold, and he doesn't understand why Leon can't tell Olga about his feelings. As they talk, they see some bullies trying to gang up against a man, and Leon goes to interfere. The Beast King asks Toya if they should join also, but they think they will spoil their disguise, so they cover their faces. They hit the men, but their ways become counterproductive when Leon finds out he is Toya, and Olga recognizes her king too. The king uses Excel to run off, while Leon drags Toya down. Toya asks Leon if he's really in love with Olga and why he can't talk. He makes Leon confess his feelings, and Olga, who is also in love with him, accepts to go out on a date with him. The other girls come out of the hideout, and they jump at them. He returns home with Yumina, and when he gets home, Liam tells him he has a visitor. He sees Lean's teddy, and wonders if the teddy has come from Miss Mead on his own. But Lean shows up with Charlotte, saying she has brought her teddy. She tells him that she wants to have a discussion with him, which is of absolute importance, and she finds out that he defeated a crystal beast in the old royal capital. She says it's Charlotte who has told her, and she also found out from Charlotte that he can use all the spells. He wonders why Charlotte has opened his secret, but Charlotte says Lean is her teacher and can't lie. She says she heard the news from a part of the city that the heaven cracked, and when she got there, she found the city in ruins and saw that a crystal beast had killed everyone. The beast has the same crystal Toya's group found, although it's in a different shape. She asks that Toya will help her defeat the beast, and also says she is now an ambassador from Miss Mead to Belfast, so she will be visiting them a lot, and she also wants him to take her somewhere. He claims he can't use Gate to get to anywhere he hasn't gotten to before, so Lean explains that there's a skill called Recall which he can use to read a person's memory and get a location so he will get there with the Gate. Lean says she's going to Ishan, and since Yai is from Ishan, he should read Yai's memory to find the picture. He does that and takes them to Ishan. They see that the city is an empty land, but Yai insists that it's her city. When they arrive at the forest, they ask Lean where she wants to go in the city, and she tells them she wants to get to Neruya Ruins. Although Yai doesn't know where the ruin is, she assumes that her father will know where it is, so they should go home to meet her father. She walks them to the city, and she shows them Obo City. Upon arriving at the city, it seems familiar with Toya's new world, and they ask her if there is also a king in her city. She explains that they technically do not have a king, but they have leaders for each city, and her leader is Leyasu. However, she sees that most people in the city are sad. They get home, and she meets her mother. She asks to meet her father, so she will ask him where the ruins are. But she tells her that her father has gone to battle with Leyasu, and her brother is also at the battle. At that moment, the probability that they will win the battle is low, and they may all die. Since she doesn't want her family to die, she asks Tuya to recall again, so she can get to them and save them. 
They return to the forest, and they plan that they will get to the battlefield with Gate, but Lean rejects the idea. She tells them they will call attention to themselves if they use Gate, so Toya suggests that he can go there first and draw himself nearer before coming to pick them up. The battle is hectic as the monsters keep regenerating after being killed, and they don't know what to do as all of their soldiers are injured. Toya appears, and he meets Yai's brother, Jutaru, who thinks he is an enemy. He tells Jutaru that he is Yai's friend and uses Gate to bring Yai. When he sees the injured soldiers, he uses his phone to multiply his healing spell through the use of a program, and he heals them immediately. Jutaru tells them that their enemies aren't dying, and they won't die unless the mask on their face falls off. Lean sees the mask as an ancient artifact, and without leaving that place, Toya uses his phone to multiply his javelin spell, and he kills them. Everyone there is shocked except his team, who knows how greatly skilled he really is. He meets with the chief of the city, Leyasu, who appreciates them for saving his city. Toya asks them if there's a way they can be sure that their enemies won't come to fight again, but Leyasu tells him that the enemies are from a neighboring city called Takeda, and there is a rumor that the king Oyakata is dead, and one of the ministers, Kensuke, is controlling a team of undead, and he is causing terror. He says the only way they can win that fight is to defeat Kansuke, which may be impossible, because he is in his kingdom. A messenger, Subaki, arrives with a letter from one of the leaders in Takeda, who complains that Kansuke has arrested all his comrades, and he is just pretending to support Kansuke so he can get his country back, so they should help him. Tuya knows they can't penetrate that city without worries, so he asks Lean if she can lend him the light spell that she uses to hide her wings. They return to the forest with Subake, and he uses Recall to get the memory of the forest from Subake. He tells them that he will use Gate to enter the city, after Lean has made him invincible, and he will release all the ministers that have been arrested before he goes to kidnap Kensuke. After becoming invisible, he tries to jump into the city, but realizes that Kensuke has protected the wall with a spell. Lean pretends to be him and touches Subake's body. He hits her to stop, and she eventually does. They enter the city through the gate, and they go to the prison, where they release the ministers led by Baba. They still can't use magic, so they try to find where the protection spell is, and they break it before going to confront Kensuke. Instead of fighting them, Kensuke sends the undead version of the dead king so the ministers can't fight their king. Tuya tells them he doesn't owe the king anything, so he shoots at him. He faces Kensuke, who tells him he has a crystal in his eyes and he can't die. But Toya uses A-ports to remove the crystal, and he destroys it. After doing so, Kensuke melts away. The people in the city appreciate Toya for saving them. Baba asks Lean where she wants to visit, and when she tells him Naruya ruins, he describes it. But she asks Toya to use recall to get the memory. They return to Yai's parents, and they bid them goodbye. Her father appreciates Toya for what he has done, and says they will find a way to repay him. After bidding their goodbyes, they use Gate to get to the ruins, and they are all amazed to see the beautiful water that's there. As they arrive at the water, the girls are super excited to swim. They remove their shoes, and they go nearer to the water, although they consider that since they aren't in a swimsuit, there's no way they can swim inside the river. On the other hand, Lean is more interested in the ruins she's come to search for. She asks Toya to help her find the ruins, and unfortunately, they find out the ruins have submerged inside the river, and they have to get to the middle of the river. The girls call out for Toya, telling him they want to swim. They remind him that if they don't swim, they won't have a memory of that place. They ask that he uses Gate to take them to the city to buy a swimsuit. He doesn't know swimsuits also exist in that world, and he's excited to see them in a swimsuit, but remembers that they're there for a mission to investigate the ruins. If they decide to have fun, it may affect their mission. Lean allows him to allow them to have their fun as long as it won't affect her mission, so they return to Belfast City to buy swimsuits. He invites every other person in the city, including Alfred and the Duke. They join the party, they all arrive at the sea, and they try to change into their swimsuits. The girls complain that there's no place for them to change their clothes, so he builds a changing room for them. They enter the room to change their clothes. The girls' physical body is so different, as some have more built bodies than others especially Linza's body, in direct opposition to Elza's body, so much that Lean mocks Elza, asking if she is indeed Linza's twin. They come out together, and they come to meet Toya, who is amazed to see them half-naked for the first time. He is so flustered by the bodies that he can't give them any reply. They enter the river to swim, and Renee comes out with Sue. That's the first time Renee sees the river, so she appreciates him for bringing her. He decides to take their picture, so he can preserve the memory. Cecile also comes out, she is more built than the other girls, and her bust floats under her clothes. 
he is glad to see her as her body jumps around, and when he comments, Lapis mistakenly hears, and he denies what he has said. He sees that Lapis doesn't intend to enter the water like the others, and he asks her why, but she tells him that she has to take care of the ladies, and that she will swap with Cecile later. The men are also having a swimming competition under the water. He sees Yumina eventually, and she asks how she looks, and he gives a great comment about her before he goes to join the girls at the river. He thinks about his mission, and he tells Lean that he'll go to check the ruins by using protection on his body. He swims inside the river after Lean has refused to follow. He gets to the front of the castle underground, but he starts to drown before he can enter. Kohaku brings him out of the river, and he presses the water away from him. When Toya wakes, he wonders if there's any spell he can use to breathe inside the water, and he asks Lean if she knows, but Lean doesn't know. Lean says she didn't learn about it, so Lean calls Charlotte to ask. Charlotte doesn't know too, but instead of allowing Charlotte to go, she insults Charlotte and says she wishes that Charlotte had grown a brain instead of a body, and punishes Charlotte by saying that she must wear her swimsuit until night. Charlotte refuses the punishment, reminding her that she also doesn't know the answer. So why punish her? Eventually, Kohaku tells them how he knows someone who can give them power to breathe underwater, and even walk underwater. He says they are in opposition to him, and they are the Black Monarch. He feels that they will require a great deal before they accept to have a pact with Tuya. Lean objects, saying that it isn't possible to personally summon a creature, let alone the Black Monarch. But Kohaku says he will join his energy with that of Tuya, and they will summon it. They do that, and they meet the Black Monarch, which consists of two bodies. They refuse to form a pact with Tuya unless he convinces them that he's strong enough by fighting them until sunset. He accepts, but instead of fighting them, he uses slip to make them fall down and uses program to control a bullet to allow them to keep falling till evening. He shoots them with the bullet, and they keep falling until they give up. They accept to form a pact with him, and he names them Kokuyu and Sango. The girls are playing basketball, and they notice he's missing. They see he's with Lean, and they get jealous. He also tells Lean that they will continue their investigation in the evening, and he should have fun with the girls first. When he goes to meet them, they accuse him of being in love with Lean. He denies it, and they refuse to believe him. They ask who is the most beautiful in the swimsuit between them, and since he doesn't want to make a choice, he picks Sue, but it angers them. They also find Sue and Renee's picture on his phone, which confirms their assumption that he's in love with Sue. He denies it, and they go to play. Later that evening, he walks under the water with Kokoyu and Sango and they get to the ruins. They enter the ruins, and he finds a place. When he stands there, the place lights up, and he disappears to a new place where he meets a random lady. He sees the girl naked, and she comes nearer to him, welcoming him to the Garden of Babylon. She tells him the garden is an aerial garden floating in the air, but he can't listen to all of her explanation because she's naked. He screams that she should wear clothes, but she tells him that she is comfortable in her panties. She says she looks normal, and he should look at her, but he can't bear himself to look at a lady without clothes on her. He tries to imagine it's just like a swimsuit, but he can't hold that imagination, so he begs her to wear clothes. She brings out her skirt and asks him if he wants to do anything before she wears it, but he denies having such intention in his heart, and he tells her to wear it. After wearing it, they begin with an introduction. She tells him that she is Francesca, and she's the protector of the Garden of Babylon, which is floating in the sky. He tries to call her, but she asks him to call her Cheska, she takes him to another part of the garden, and she explains to him where they are. She tells him that the garden was created by her master, Professor Regina Babylon, over 5,000 years ago, and Babylon has told them she will put them in the care of a person who is as skilled as her. Cheska says she doesn't have the opportunity to come out and control the garden, except in emergencies, just like the one which just happened. She tells him that the teleportation magic that brought him to the garden can only work if he is the special person it should work for. He's the only one who has walked inside the garden for about 5,000 years. The teleportation magic can only work with a person with affinity with all elements, just like Babylon herself. As a result, he has proved himself as a good candidate to take the ownership of the garden. His pet sees that he can't view a sense of human in Cheska, and he tells Toya about this. So Toya asks Cheska if she is a machine. Cheska says that she is a union of mechanical life and magic. She has the ability to have intercourse, but she can't procreate. She says she picked him as her owner, not only because he has an affinity to all elements, but also because he's a good man who didn't take advantage of her when he saw her naked. She says Babylon taught her that when the owner comes, she should show up naked, and if he tries to molest her, she should kick him off. If he doesn't complain about her dress, she should send him away so he does well, and he is qualified. At the river, the girls see a crab, and Charlotte goes to take it, but it falls into the water, and the crab hides in her swimsuit. 
The girls with big bodies complain about the things attached to their bodies, while Lean tells the other girls that they can't relate. They wonder why Toya hasn't returned, and they hope he's fine. And about the same time, he returns. He opens the gate and takes them to the garden. They meet Cheska, who tells them Toya is now her master because he has seen her panties, and that gets Linza angry. She accuses him of going around to look at every lady's panties and reminds him of when he saw them naked in the bathroom. He tells them it's a mistake, but Linza refuses to hear. Lean laughs at them, telling them that the person they're having issues with doesn't understand, and unless the other girls have a specified place in his life, like Yumina, they're just wasting their time. Yumina tells them they should take a walk, and they do so, and the other girls are insecure that they left Toya with Lean and Cheska. But Yumina tells them they don't have to worry. She asks if they can have the conclusion of the conversation they had the day they relocated into the mansion. She reminds them that on that day, she met with them and told them she knew they loved Toya, and she wasn't interested in monopolizing Toya since she felt he would become something big in the future. She can't assist him alone, so she asks them if they are interested in being Toya's brides. They all refused the offer that day, so she told them they should think about it and tell her their opinion later. She resumes the conversation, accusing them that they have gotten nervous since that day and they take care of him, so she asks them if they have reached a decision. They consider the options, but none of them accept at that moment. They're flustered and their faces become red. They return to join Tuya, who notices their red faces, although they deny that anything happened. He asks Lean what was her intention when she decided to find the ruins, and she says it's because she wants artifacts. Cheska tells her that her garden is just a beautiful garden, and there's nothing there. But she has other sister gardens which contain library and other important places, but they're scattered around the world, and they can't be seen. Linza suggests that they use Toya's phone to find it, but they can't find it. They conclude the only way is to use the same teleportation he used to find the garden, which can only work if he finds their ruins. He asks Cheska if she can follow him home, and she replies affirmatively, but says she has to completely pass over the ownership of the garden to him first. She stands up and kisses him, and after she's done, he says he is now the real owner, and the kiss was to register his genetics. Yumina gets angry that even she hasn't kissed him before. Linza gets the courage to express her love to him, and she tells him that she loves him. She also goes nearer to kiss him. He takes Cheska home, and he introduces Cheska to Liam, asking Liam to take care of her even though Cheska insists that she can take care of herself. After he finishes the introduction, he goes to his room. He is so tired of the situation he has kept to himself, and he doesn't know how to manage it. He collapses on the bed as he thinks of Linza's proposal. He hasn't even made a decision in regard to how he will manage Yumina, and adding Linz to it sounds like a mission impossible. He wonders what he will do, and he hears a knock on his door. He asks who is at the door, and Yumina says it's her. He thinks she's coming to get angry at him because of Linz's conversation, so he gets scared but reluctantly opens the door. He allows her inside the room, and she tells him she's angry at him. She says that even she, who is his wife, has never been allowed to kiss him, and she is disappointed that he's allowed two other people to kiss him before her. He figures she isn't angry about Linz's confession, and he tries to apologize, but she tells him she knows that Linz was in love with him, and everyone knew about the love except him. She tells him that she doesn't have a problem with him getting married to Linz and her, but she's only angry that she allowed them to kiss him first instead of her. So she says that the only way he can make up for his offense against her is if he hugs and kisses her. He feels her solution is outstretched. However, since that is the only condition for her to forgive him, he knows he doesn't have a choice but to accept. She sits beside him, and he holds her by the neck. She goes nearer to him, and he voluntarily kisses her. She is glad that she is the first person he's kissing voluntarily. She then asks him what he thinks about Linz's proposal. He admits that Linza is cute and he likes her, but he hasn't even figured out how he would marry Yumina, let alone marry the two of them. She asks him to admit that he likes Linza, and when he does, she calls out for Linza, who is inside the room with Lean's invisibility. She explains that Linza felt bad about her confession because he didn't give her a response, and he ran away, so she begged Lean for her invisibility, and she entered the room when Yumina entered. He tells her that he likes her, and Yumina asks if he can marry Linza. He concludes that if Yumina doesn't have an issue with it, then it's fine. They ask him to kiss them before they leave the room, so he kisses them on their foreheads. The following day, he's awakened by a knock on the door, and it turns out to be Elza. She says she wants to see him outside, and when he gets there, he meets Yai waiting for him. They tell him that he heard that he is accepted to marry Linza, and they say they wish they had Linza's courage, but they don't. So the only way they can do it is when they face a threat. They ask him to fight them and whosoever wins the fight out of the two teams will agree to a request made by the other team. 
He reluctantly accepts, and they fight. He puts his gun on Elsa's neck, and she asks him to shoot. He says he won't do that if she gives up. She tells him he's too nice, which is why she is also in love with him, and Ye too. They show him they have removed the bullets from his pocket, so he has lost, and he must agree to their request. They ask him to marry them. He doesn't know what to do, and he sees Yumina coming. She tells him she was the one who asked them to do it, and she's comfortable with the marriage. He refuses to agree immediately, so he tells them he will get back to them later. He goes to the garden to rest, and Cheska comes to meet him. He tries to confide in Cheska regarding what's happening. He says it's not like he doesn't like them, but he thinks he won't be able to satisfy them all. Cheska remembers that Regina Babylon left him a message. She brings out a cord and gives it to him, and when he puts it in his phone, he sees Babylon. She calls him by his name, and he wonders how she knew his name. So she explains that she sees the past, and she sees everything happening between him and his friends. He then asks her if she knows what the future holds for them, but she refuses to tell him. He then visits God. He asks God what he should do, and God tells him he should just try to enjoy the situation. He refuses that advice, so God brings him a better person to advise him, and it turns out to be the God of love. She tells him he should remove what he has learned from his past life from his mind, and as long as the girls are satisfied with it, there's no problem. He wonders if he will be able to satisfy them. She tells him love isn't one-sided, and he has to be selfish sometimes. He takes her decision and returns to speak with the girls. He tells them that he doesn't want to marry them, but they don't listen to all that he has to say before they try to fight him. So he tells them he doesn't want to marry yet, but he will marry them later. He tells them that any of them who grows out of love can cast him aside when he is ready, but they promise they won't grow out of love. Lean, Cheska, and Charlotte look at them from the window. Cheska says Babylon told her Toya would marry nine wives, and Lean wonders if Charlotte is on the list too. At this point, the series ends.